And what I want to do in the time that remains is just to give you some sense of how these whitewashings unfold on paper. Most of you will be familiar with some of it, but uh, hopefully I can add to your um, storehouse of knowledge. The first thing all these human rights supports do is they try to pretend both sides suffered. So Amnesty International writes, on both sides, civilians once again bore the brunt. UN Human Rights Council, uh, which also produced a complete whitewash, it wrote, the commission was deeply moved by the immense suffering of Palestinian and Israeli victims. Okay, both sides suffered. So let's see how both sides suffered. Civilians killed, 1,600 Palestinians, six Israelis. Ratio, 270 to one. Children killed, 550 Palestinian children, one Israeli child. Well, it doesn't require a Palestinian civil engineer to figure out that ratio. It's 550 to one. Homes destroyed, Palestinian homes, 18,000, Israeli, one. Even a humanities major can figure out that ratio, it's 18,000 to one. And then you have to ask yourself, I won't cue you, I won't try to influence you, I will simply ask you to use your own judgment. 270 to 1, 550 to 1, 18,000 to 1 is an apt description of what happened. Both sides suffered. Civilians on both sides once again bore the brunt. Does that description accurately capture what happened during Operation Protective Le Edge? These human rights organizations, they like to conjure this image of this ominous, sinister Hamas armor, armory, armaments, <clears throat> uh, armaments. So they'll tell you that it has BM-21 Grad rockets, which as we know is much worse than BP. 20, 20 grad rockets. And then they'll tell you that Hamas has those Iranian Fajr 5 rockets. And we know if it's Iranian, it must really be sinister and ominous. So you see in the human rights reports, and you see in the mainstream media, and you see in all the standard scholarship these numbers, and they're always accompanied by these graphics of this Hamas arsenal of weapons. But then, if you're a rational observer applying your critical faculty in even a minimum way, you ask yourself, I think, a fairly obvious question. Where did they get those numbers? If you know the quantity of weapons in Hamas's arsenal, and you know the quality of the weapons in Hamas's arsenal, then you have to know where they are. Otherwise, how would you know the quantity and the quality? Maybe you got it through your very effective uh, um, surveillance system. Maybe you got it through your very effective uh, collaborators, but however you got it, you can only know the quantity and the quality if you know where they are. Which brings us to the next obvious question. If you know where the weapons are, why didn't Israel preempt them? Everybody knows because Israel boasts, as it has in the last few weeks, that in the last year alone, it preempted a hundred armed shipments from Syria to Hezbollah. They have no compunction about preempting weapons. They boast about it. 
So then you ask yourself the obvious question. If Hamas had this terrifying, lethal arsenal of weapons that was existentially threatening Israel, then why didn't it preempt the weapons? Well, the answer is perfectly obvious on the moment's reflection, because Israel just plucks these numbers from thin air uh, and dutifully repeated by not only the mainstream media, but even in the human rights reports. Now, some of you in the room who abide by the credo of my generation from the 1960s and 70s, uh, our credo was we used to wear a black button with white lettering. Some of the older people in the room will remember. It said, question authority, which I think is always a wise thing to do. Or as Karl Marx, who was a very smart Jewish boy, so he spoke the uh, Latin, he said, de omnibus dubitandum, to doubt everything. And it's fair of you to doubt me in the claim that I just made, because I freely admit it's speculative, I think it's compelling and convincing, but it still falls within the category of speculation. It doesn't fall into the category of fact. So let's turn to the facts. Israel, its supporters, the mainstream media, human rights organizations, they all claim that Hamas had this terrifying arsenal of weapons. And then the obvious thing to do then is to look at, well, what was the damage done by these weapons? Hamas fired, according to Israel and various human rights, uh, excuse me, UN observatory agencies, Hamas fired about 5,000 rockets into Israel. A 5,000 is a formidable number, especially in a relatively small place. 5,000 rockets. So the question is, okay, 5,000 rockets, that sounds awful. What kind of damage did it do? And here, actually, Israel was quite helpful. It, every day of Operation Protective Edge, it had a um, website, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where it was called Daily Diary, and it listed the damage done every day. And I reproduce that daily diary in the book. And if you do the arithmetic, again, even a sociology major could figure out this one. If you go through the 51 days, one house was destroyed. One. One house was destroyed. Well, then you ask yourself a pretty obvious question. How could it be that 5,000 rockets only destroyed one house? Now, I freely admit to having no military experience whatsoever. I freely admit that it would probably be a total nincompoop uh, were I to be drafted into the army. Uh, however, maybe this will sound like an idle boast, but I think that if I had a backyard, which I don't, but if I did, and it were stockpiled with 5,000 rockets, which it isn't, but if it were uh, 5,000 rockets in my backyard, and if I were blindfolded, and if I were, had my back to the launching site, I still think if I had launched 5,000 rockets, I would have destroyed more than one house. That just doesn't make sense. It makes sense only if they weren't rockets. They're just fireworks or enhanced fireworks. And the, um, the, sad, the sad footnote to it is that both Israel and Hamas had a mutual interest, a mutual stake in pretending they were rockets. Israel, so we can claim it's acting in self-defense, and Hamas, so it can claim that armed resistance is working. You see how they're afraid of our rockets? You see how they're trembling at our rockets? And so both of them made, so to speak, something out of what was really nothing. Now, there will probably be one or two people in the room uh, who may not self-identify, but are working for, so to speak, the other side. And they're thinking, aha, gotcha, now we got him. Now we can prove he's a fake, a fraud, and even worse, because he left our miracle, our 
uh, wizardry, uh, the product of our wizardry, which was Iron Dome, their anti-missile defense system. And they would say, if they were bold enough to reveal the fact that they are Mossad agents who have penetrated this holy gathering, they would say that if there was so little physical damage, it was because of Iron Dome. And I see some people nodding in the front row. I don't know if it's because they agree with the Israelis or because they are Israelis. But um, so here again, we have the evidence. We're no longer in the area of speculation. We're in the area of fact. The facts are as follows. Israel only deployed Iron Dome around its major urban centers. According to Israel, of those 5,000 rockets, approximately 820 came within the vicinity of Iron Dome. Israel claims of those 820, they intercepted 90% of the rockets, or 740. One of the world's leading experts in anti-missile technology, uh, Theodore Postel, at MIT, he said, well, I went through the evidence. I'm a little skeptical of 90%. I think it was a kind of underwhelming 5%. You may have intercepted 40 rockets. But let's take the Israeli numbers for argument's sake. Let's say they intercepted 740 rockets. Well, then you do the arithmetic. There were 5,000 rockets fired. Subtract 740, I'm pointing to this young lady because she said her field is mathematics, so, or her top field. Uh, so that still leaves thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of rockets. How could, even if we accept the Israeli numbers, how could 4,200 and more rockets only destroy one house. And again, we're left with the same conclusion. They weren't rockets. They were what the respected mainstream journal, Foreign Affairs, they had an article on the topic and they called it, the title was, Bottle Rockets. Bottle Rockets, as some of you might recall, I remember it from my youth, not that I ever used one. I had a very protective <laughs> Jewish mother. And if I, next, uh, if I had to choose between dying in an uh, explosion of uh, the fireworks or confronting my mother with the fact that I had used them, I would rather die. But in any case, you remember they had that thin piece of wood attached to a firecracker and a fuse. You put it in a Coca-Cola bottle. That's a, that's a bottle rocket. And that's what the Hamas terrifying, sinister arsenal of weapons consisted. It consisted of bottle rockets. It wasn't just the bottle, it wasn't just the rockets. Everything that you were told about, everything that you were told about protective edge, uh, I wish I could call it not true, but I'll just call it a lie uh, to avoid, to just not engage in this kind of euphemism so as not to offend and to be scholarly. All of you know about the terror tunnels, those tunnels that were burrowed underneath the border between the West Bank and Israel. And those terror tunnels were supposed to, uh, let's see if we could just find the quote. Uh, yes, Netanyahu said, Prime Minister Netan Benjamin Netanyahu he said, the sole purpose of these tunnels was to annihilate our citizens and kill our children. And that's why they were designated terror, terror tunnels. And now it's true that Hamas had built a very formidable network of tunnels in Gaza. It didn't entirely surprise me because, as we know, uh, uh, 10 out of every nine Arabs is a civil or electrical engineer. <laughs> and I didn't get it wrong. I did mean 10 out of every nine. I don't want you to accuse me of being mathematically numer, numer illiterate, whatever it's called. Um, and so in Gaza, you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of unemployed engineers. 
So you, it's not altogether surprising that they would be able to build a very sophisticated uh, tunnel network. But the question for our purposes is, who are these tunnels targeting? And Israel itself freely admitted afterward, they said, they weren't targeting civilians. The Hamas militants who emerged from the tun tunnels, they were targeting combatants. They never once, never once targeted a civilian. And we have the evidence for that. And as I said, Israel then freely admitted it. What was the purpose of the tunnels? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, but again, it's speculation. They were trying to capture an Israeli soldier or soldiers to arrange for another kind of prison release, like with Gilad Shalit, for those of you who uh, remember, uh, where one Israeli prisoner, excuse me, one Hamas prisoner of an Israeli was then exchanged for a thousand and more Palestinian detainees. So they were trying to capture an Israeli soldier. They were never targeting civilians. The long and the short of it is, all the big takeaways from Operation Protective Edge, Hamas rockets, Iron Dome, terror tunnels, they never happen. They're just propaganda inventions which were then um, appropriated uh, by the media or repeated by the media, human rights organizations, and unfortunately also in most cases by Hamas itself. I want to just look at one last aspect and then we're going to open it up for questions and I'll have approximately an hour and I want that hour with you. Um, one of the most uh, really wretched uh, aspects of Operation Protective Edge was the systematic methodical destruction of Palestinian homes. And um, one always hesitates at this moment to be emotive, that means appealing to your emotions, or demagogic, which means basically appealing to your irrational. But sometimes I think when you recite statistics too much, it has a kind of deadening effect and it fails to arouse uh, the hearts, uh, hearts as well as the minds of people. So the context. 70% of the population of Gaza consists of people who are refugees. What's a refugee? It's somebody who lost their homeland. And then if you lost your homeland, now 50 years later, all you have left is your home. The one thing you were able to build, build up. You lost your homeland, you have your home. And um, losing your home is, um, significant. Uh, if you're anything like me, if you folks in the room are anything like me, I'm working one night writing something, then I hit the wrong key, don't remember which key it was, or there's some sort of power outage or something, and I lose that two hours of work. And then I just become hysterical. <laughs> two hours of genius. Two hours of brilliance, two hours of unreplicable inspiration. Not even I can reproduce it. It was so incredible. It has now vanished into cyberspace. And then I start frenetically calling my friends, can you retrieve it? Can you find it? And I get the very painful news, Norman, it's gone. It's gone. And then I start pacing my apartment, appealing, where is God? Where is God at this moment? There can't be a God. I just lost two hours of my work. Now ask yourself, what does it mean to lose your home? Everything you've accumulated in your life is in that home, everything. For you young people, you don't know what it was like before the digital age. All the photographs. Album photographs. Yeah, the album photographs. They're gone. All the letters, the letters you wrote to your parents or they wrote to you when you were away in school or away in camp, they're all gone. And then you have child, children, 
a doll, all the priceless uh, memories. Everything is gone. The home is gone. So, 18,000 homes were destroyed in Gaza. How did that happen? Amnesty International put out a report called Families Under the Rubble. And they're going to investigate, or they proceeded to investigate, the cases where Israel um, targeted homes where large numbers of civilians perished, sometimes families of 15 uh, that, uh, perish in the blink of an eye, uh, extended families. And they say, yes, it's true, to go back to what I said earlier, they said it's true, Israel used disproportionate force. Yes, they say Israel used indiscriminate force. However, they say, well, we looked very carefully into these cases and we found that in every case we examined, there might have been a Hamas militant in that house. There might have been a Hamas militant in the house. And if you look carefully as I did, the, end, the evidence is very slender, very flimsy, but that's only half the story because people in the room will say, and there's an argument to be made, that, well, you're a prejudiced observer, you're looking to, you're looking to indict Israel, so what you call slender, what you call flimsy, may be a quote-unquote more objective observer would find compelling and convincing. And that would all be an argument, except for one thing. The one thing is what the Israeli combatants themselves said. After Operation Cast uh, Protective Edge, um, the Israeli military organization Breaking the Silence, which collects testimonies of Israeli soldiers who were witness firsthand to what happened in Protective Edge, they describe it. Now, lest there be any misunderstanding, if you look at their report, and I would strongly urge you to do so, just go to your website, Breaking the Silence, Protective Edge, and the report will come up. And at the risk of alienating my own publisher, I would say sooner read that report than read my book. And I mean that. Because the soldier witnesses, they're not ashamed, they're not embarrassed, they show no remorse, no contrition, they just matter-of-factly describe what happened. And overwhelmingly, the, report, the soldier testimonies focus on those houses. So what happened to those houses? Amnesty said there were Hamas militants in those houses. How did the Operation Protective Edge begin? So let's quote the soldier. I got the impression that every house we passed on our way in got hit by a shell, and houses farther away too. It was methodical. There was no threat, says the soldier, quoting him verbatim. What did the middle, the middle of the Operation Protective Edge look like? It was 51 days. There was a broad middle. So here's what a soldier says. The D9, D9 are the bulldozers, the D9 operators didn't rest for a second. Non-stop, as if they were playing in a sandbox, driving back and forth back and forth, demolishing another house, demolishing another street, day and night, 24-7, they went back and forth, flattening house after house. How did the operation end? 
The very day we left Gaza, says the soldier, all the houses we had stayed in were blown up by combat engineers. What does amnesty say? There was probably a Hamas militant in all the houses that Israel destroyed. Well, that's just shameful and shameless. One last example, and then we're opening it up for questions. Let's take the case of Shujaya. Shujaya is among the most densely populated neighborhoods in Gaza, which is the most densely, among the most densely populated places on Earth. So, what happens in Shujaya? There was a firefight outside Shujaya, and uh, about uh, let's get the exact number. 13 Israeli soldiers were killed. It was unusual. And now Israel wants to exact revenge because Israel has a very peculiar, eccentric notion of war. Uh, their concept of war is Israeli soldiers are not supposed to die in the war. Uh, everybody else is supposed to get killed, uh, but not Israeli soldiers. And here was a, from the Israeli point of view, something... Um, something uh, evil had really happened, and this Israeli soldier had been killed. And so they proceed to target Shujaya. And um, they say that we needed to rescue injured soldiers in Shujaya. So how they rescue injured soldiers? Well, they drop more than 100, more than 100, one-ton bombs on Shijaya. Then they fired thousands of high-explosive, indiscriminate artillery shells into Shijaya. The Human Rights Council investigates what happened in Shijaya, and they agree with Israel. The purpose of this attack was what they call force protection. Force protection. Protecting injured soldiers. So you look at that and you think, now wait a minute, okay. Let's say this gentleman here in the plaid red and white uh, shirt, he's an injured Israeli soldier. And you want to rescue this injured soldier. So how do you rescue him? You drop a one-ton bomb on his head. <laughs> oh. That makes a lot of sense. Or you want to rescue him, you fire thousands of high explosive artillery shells in the area where he is. I'm reading this, you don't know whether to laugh or cry. Maybe in order to rescue him, I mean, I guess the obvious solution is they should have dropped, they should have nuked him. That would have rescued him. The, the level of absurdity, of ridiculousness of these human rights organizations and Israel as they proceed to make apologies for the crimes that were committed were really appalling. And then we're left with one last comment and we're done and we're opening it up to you. The last comment is, even though it was weak and feeble, the human rights organizations were the only impediment to the full and complete release of Israel's murder machine. And when the human rights organizations folded, capitulated, it was a very sorry moment. Israel knew it had one chink in its armor. The one chink was breaking the silence because those reports were totally and completely devastating in their descriptions of how Israel carried on. One soldier after another, literally, I mean, you have to read it to believe it. One soldier after another was saying, what were our ru rules of engagement? Our rules of engagement were, quote, shoot to kill everything that moves, and even if it doesn't move. That's what the soldier said. Israel is saying we have the most moral army in the world. The soldiers in the field said, we were told, shoot to kill everything that moves and what doesn't move. So Israel knew it had a real problem with breaking the silence. 
And for the last couple of years, they've been going after breaking the silence relentlessly, uh, checking on its funding, which is a large amount of money came from Europeans, calling them traitors, calling them a fifth army, calling them enemies. And it's very unlikely that in the event of next Israeli attack, there will be, there will be a, bra a bra uh, breaking the silence to testify. And so without the human rights organizations and without the breaking the silence, that last impediment to Israel's killing machine will have been removed. And so as awful as the record I've described has been, my guess is it's going to be uh, much worse if and when the next attack comes. Thank you.